Good evening. As co-convener of the Temple Women's Forum and on behalf of the committee, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Temple Women's Forum annual networking party. It's just wonderful to be able to hold this event in person after the 18 month hiatus due to COVID. Um, and whilst the ongoing restrictions um, at that time meant that we couldn't do our usual um, June party in the garden, um, we're very pleased that it has been possible to do an event this year, uh, albeit on a smaller scale than usual. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our guest speaker, Carrie Matabu QC. And as many of you know, he is a senior and very successful commercial QC and arbitrator at Britcourt Chambers. He is founder of the Charter for Black Talent in Finance and the Professions, itself modeled on the Women in Finance Charter, seeking to attract, develop, and retain Black and female talent, respectively. He's a real champion of diversity and inclusivity. Um, and the thought that he's given to and the experience that he has of such issues will be relevant to many in this audience. Women have come a very long way since the roughly 100 years since the first women were admitted to the solicitor's profession and the bar. Um, but there's an increasing level of recognition um, regarding the barriers that still face women in the law. So I'm going to hand over now to Harry. Thank you. Well, good evening. And thank you, Leanne, for that kind, if interestingly short introduction. Just long enough to spare us both the embarrassment of my rather paltry qualifications, but short enough to raise the question why is he actually here? Master of the roles, you uh, need no introduction. Um, I know that your hosts are delighted to see you here tonight and you have the freedom of the forum to go about this gathering in the easy luxury of your position, feasting on canapes and interrupting conversations with a warm benevolence that seems to fall almost like a benediction on the shoulders of all the contemporary holders of your great office of Lord Benny You, my Lord, are, are welcome everywhere. I, by contrast, must sing tonight for my volobons. This is my first invitation to the Temple Women's Forum, and the summons arrived in an envelope of uncertainty. Why, they ask, is he actually here? Well, I'm still asking myself that question, and uh, this uncertainty is, I have to say, a two-way mirror, because to answer that question, I have also asked myself, why are you all actually here? And that is something that I want to explore tonight. But before I do, I thought it would be useful to give a sense of this gathering from my vantage point up here so that I could then advise the master of the roles before he embarks on his agreeable task of working the room. Now, usually at these events, one finds a hard core of rowdies by the bar or by the door to the kitchen, forming an impenetrable phalanx rather like the Spartans at Thermopylae, to stop all food and drink escaping to a wider world, battle-hardened veterans ready to die for that cause. And here, my Lord, will be found those who in school days always occupied the back of the bus, the bad girls of the criminal bar and the circus. And on the other side of the room, at the front of the bus, as it were, one would expect to see the swaps and the prefects. And in the middle, between these two poles, a large tide of the undecided, uncertain whether to hang out with the bad girls or to walk forward towards preeminence and privilege. And of course, long experience shows that those at the back of the bus are always, in fact, pushing us forward towards the front. And indeed, some of them may make their own way forwards eventually. 
And so who is at the front of the bus? The judges, of course. But the bus metaphor doesn't really, doesn't really work at this stage because they don't gather at the front on these occasions. The judges rather shimmer on one side. And here you'll find the current and former justices of the High Court, the Lady Justices of Appeal, the Justices of the Supreme Court, arrayed in splendid formation around the senior person present. I haven't been able so far to identify who they are this evening, but uh, on parade I have seen Lady Justice Davis and Lady Justice Whipple, whom we congratulate on her recent elevation and whom we wish the very best of fortune in her new position, and several others whom I look forward to meeting later on. What a group they must be, you can imagine them all formed up discreetly on one side. Pearl Harbor. And I hope their presence tonight will inspire those of you at the beginning or in the middle of your careers to become what you seek. And if my experience is anything like theirs, your presence tonight will inspire them to continue to give the leadership which will advance the cause of women at the bar and in the professions generally in a sometimes stubbornly conservative world. An event such as this and the open armed support that a collective group can give to its leaders, whether judges, officers, benches of the in circuit leaders or heads of chambers, reaffirms the bond between you all, which will give focus and power to a cause which is far from one. And it seems to me that this is a powerful reason why you should gather here tonight and why you should always see it as a matter of obligation as well as enjoyment to attend such an event. So why am I here? One reason is the possibility of shared experience, where some reflections from my very short journey along this road may find resonance with at least some of you. My friends, the transformative power of a forum of the gathering of a group with shared experience was never so powerfully demonstrated as in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd. And the visceral reaction of black people around the world, including professionals and executives from the privileged classes who vividly recognized what lay beneath that appalling episode, the comparatively low value placed by society on their achievements and their aspirations. The ingrained stereotypes which reduce black people, however highly educated and qualified, to risks which should be kept away from the most significant work, rather than assets whose talent and potential should be developed and given full expression. And a similar attitude has been taken to women in business and the professions down the ages. And the killing of George Floyd unleashed an astonishing sharing of experience which shocked us all. And so now business and soon regulators will require clear evidence of environmental, social and governance commitment as a principal indicator of an organization's work. And the bar is not new. As we emerge from the pandemic, we see that we've moved to a world where what matters to clients, to employees, and to the best prospective recruits are not profits, but the values that one expresses through one's business. And we, our chambers, our inns, our firms will now be held accountable if we do not show through transparent and measurable means our commitment to values, including diversity and inclusion. And that is the power of my charter for black talent. And it is, I suggest, one way in which your forum can challenge chambers to demonstrate their commitment to equality for women and other groups. And I'm also here to tell you that the reaction to the killing of George Floyd 
also revealed to the diaspora of black professionals around the world that their own concerns and experiences were exactly the same as those of countless others, that they were not imagining or overreacting to disappointments in their career, but that there was a commonality in the experience of thousands of people of discrimination and ingrained bias which could not be ignored. And as black professionals, we have all struggled with the weight of that common experience. And we have struggled in particular as we have seen our children become aware during this period of the burden of unfairness that awaits them when they embark on their careers. And women must feel the same for their daughters in the workplace. Just as they are now impelled to fight for their daughters to be freed from the fear of physical assault and brutality in public spaces. There are parallels between the killing of George Floyd and the killing of Sarah Everard, and most recently the killing of Sabrina Nessa. And you find it in the power of the collective reaction of men and women of decency to the injustice that they have witnessed in silence for so long, and in the urgent search for a truly meaningful response from an establishment that had become perhaps a little too relaxed about the status quo. Now, progress on diversity is very difficult in this profession. I speak to you from my experience as a black barrister who has practiced for 30 years at the commercial bar. And as I have often said, I am the highly privileged product of a public school Oxbridge education. And even so, in my career, I have witnessed my embarrassed clerk telling me on more than one occasion that solicitors said that they would not consider me for a high profile brief because, quote, the client would probably not be comfortable. And then being left with that corrosive thought throughout my career. And like every single other black professional in this or any other job, I have carried throughout my career the burden of expectation. An expectation that I'm too much of a risk and that I won't be any good. And so I look back on a career where I have often worked twice as hard to get half as far with the inevitable destruction of a work-life balance and an eventual toll on physical, if not mental health. And the testimony of so many Black professionals post-George Floyd has shown me that mine is a typical story. And so we must harness the power of shared experience into mutual support. But is there more to be done to create a fairer and more equal environment in which all can flourish in one of the most fiercely competitive markets in the world, a market which prides itself on being a true meritocracy, where it's assumed that true talent will always get to the top because that is how market forces work. How perfect is this market? How genuine is this meritocracy? Because the hard data that is now being gathered tells a troubling story, as does my experience as I look back on my career. And that's why I asked myself at the beginning of this talk, why are you all actually here? Well, that's a question for each of us to determine for ourselves. I have challenged myself to take a stand in these fora, if I am ever invited, and on social media, and it has not been my comfort zone. And it has for decades been a difficult world for talented professional women to progress in because of systemic biases. It's also been a difficult world for talented professionals of color particularly black, black professionals who are the most underrepresented group at the bar and in the professions and financial services. 
And so what if you are both black and a woman? This, my friends, is the principal reason why I decided to accept your kind invitation to speak to you tonight. You've seen the report from the Bar Council in January of this year, which showed that barristers from ethnic minority or mixed backgrounds were disproportionately affected by financial pressures resulting from the pandemic, working to the point of exhaustion to keep afloat. You've also seen the data published by the Bar Standards Board last year on income by gender and ethnicity, which records that female, black and minority ethnic barristers are the lowest earning group. And that within that hopelessly wide BAME category, black and black British barristers earn less than Asian and Asian British barristers overall. But still, black, Women barristers show up for work. How is that? Much has been written and rightly about the young black footballers who accepted without question the heavy responsibilities thrust on their young shoulders in the Euros tournament and who reacted with such dignity to the vile opprobrium that was heaped on them when they failed to secure victory for the England team. But they are not unique to football. Their light can be found in so many black families in this country and around the world. And if you think those young lions are something, wait till you see the female of the species. Well, the lionesses I can see here among you tonight, and they walk tall. And I am here because they are here. This is the species of whom Maya Angelou wrote in her famous poem, you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies, you may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust I'll rise. Still they rise in our world with the ability, the focus, the commitment and the resilience that we look for in any leader, qualities which are unaccountably overlooked in our world when they are demonstrated by black women. Still they rise, lionesses, who are in fact having to navigate two worlds, a professional world in which they must make their own way and as I have said before, work twice as hard to get half as far and a world at home where well, like other women from ethnic minorities, they are often also expected to perform the traditional duties of principal carer, not only for a younger generation, but also for aging relatives. And still they rise. Like the 26 year old Alexandra Wilson, Oxford graduate, master's degree holder, Queen scholar of this inn, who after being mistaken for a criminal defendant three times in one day, declined to take it silently and wrote a book about it to draw attention to the injustice of unthinking and ingrained prejudice. And still they rise. And we should cherish them. Because by their example, they give us all the courage to rise. Whether we are the leaders to whom women and other underrepresented groups in our profession look for inspiration and representation, or whether we are the members of this or any other forum sitting in the middle or at the back of the bus, who have our own individual voice to use on professional bodies and perhaps most importantly in our chamber's meetings. And so still we rise more powerfully than ever to accelerate progress in this era where doing a little is no longer enough. And where if any organization is to attract and retain clients and the best talent, it has to identify its values and to demonstrate them through purposeful and measurable action. This is how our merit will now also be judged we who so often invoke meritocracy as a justification for the status quo. Well, you've been very kind. Very kind to listen to me for so long. 
And I shall now leave you to renew acquaintances, to make connections, and perhaps even to indulge our masters a role. And as I subside, let me ask you to raise your glasses. In a toast to our lionesses and to ourselves, still we rise. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.